outcomes. So what is estate planning? This is our agenda for today. What is estate planning? What should I think about? Some basic concepts. In a family meeting, choose an executor. My expertise is needed in the next steps. Estate planning isn't something onto itself. We also recommend that tax, legal, and accounting professional advice, depending on the family situation, also be utilized um, in order to get effective estate plan put into place. So estate planning is about making decisions to safeguard your assets, to reduce and defer taxes, maximizing the value of your estate so that the assets can be distributed the way you wish. It provides peace of mind knowing that you're leaving your loved ones in the best possible situation. Why should I think about state planning? It allows time for you to think about what your goals and intentions are. It's a clear mind. It creates a scenario for ensuring your wishes. It provides greater peace of mind. Um, and leaving the legacy that you want to leave to family charitable organizations, or whatever the case may be. Basic concepts of your will. So your will is a legal document that sets out the instructions of how you want your estate to be distributed. Points the executor, or what we call the estate trustee, appoints the guardian for your minor children or dependent children. What happens if you die without a will? A lot of people think, oh, the government gets it all. That's not the case. If there's no will, the first 200,000 will go to a spouse and one third of the remainder will go to the spouse. Any children will share equally in the remaining two thirds. No children, um, no spouse. They will keep going down the family line until they can find beneficiaries to request money to the wishes of the um, estate. Also part of estate planning is power of attorney. And there's two of them. There's the um, continuing power of attorney or the power of attorney for financial matters. And then there's also the power of attorney for personal care. The power of attorney for property or finance can be what they call limited or general. Usually the ones that are drafted at the lawyer's offices are the general power of attorney. So they can do, the power of attorney can do anything and everything you would normally do other than elected beneficiaries. And there's a limited power of attorney, which often is used for, if you're down south from the days when we could travel, when limited power of attorney would authorize somebody to process paperwork for the sale of a property, it may be limited to a specific bank account or transaction. The power of attorney for personal care is exactly that. Somebody was elected to make the decisions on your behalf and it's in conjunction with a health professional usually that these decisions are, are made. So it could be end of life decisions, um, things like that. There's also a, what they call a living will. That is a will that exactly as it says here, what you want and don't want to have doctors do um, for end of life health care. How your loved ones know what to do in a medical crisis without having to wonder later if they did the right thing. Many people include a living will as part of their power of attorney for personal care, i.e. Do I want to be on life support? Do I want organ donation? Um, this type of things. Um, in a medical crisis, you know, adrenaline is running high and, and people need to know what your decision making process is. Income tax. This is the big evil everybody is concerned about. Um, so income tax is assessed upon death and typically includes earned income during your final year of life, capital gains associated with the disposition of capital property. So these could be investments or real estate, um, businesses, etc. Income earned from the dean proceeds of RSPs and RIFs. For RSP and 
breath. If there is no beneficiary, um, RSPs and MERS will flow over to your spouse tax free if they're the designated beneficiary. But if there is no spouse designated and um, and that income is that RIF is deemed as if it was redeemed, or the RSP as if it was redeemed one second before you died. So there's tax consequences there. And there's a few ways to minimize taxes, transferring assets to a spouse or a financially independent minor child, grandchild, naming beneficiaries on those investments. Um, my concern when we're um, naming a child or grandchild as a beneficiary on some of those, a minor one on those, some of those assets. Very careful if it is a child that may have a disability. Because if you name them as a beneficiary, that money could um, limit the amount of support that they're getting because they factor that in. That's where registered disability savings plans and hence and trust accept to come into play. So it's just something to keep in mind. I'm not going to go into big details on that right now because that is all topic onto it onto itself. You can name beneficiaries on registered investment plans, so i.e. your RSPs, gifts, tax-free savings plans. And um, some provinces don't allow it, but here in Ontario it is allowed. Um, and farm property. They allow um, farm property rollover to family members on a tax exempt basis. Um, your accountant would be best to put those plans in place for you to make sure that it rolls over in a tax efficient manner and you're not paying tax on the rollover of that farm property to your family members. So once you've gone through that thinking about tax efficiency, what is probate? Probate is a fee that's levied by the provincial courts to confirm the validity and the appointment of your executor for the estate. And your executor or your lawyer will apply to the provincial court for a certificate verifying the above. Um, how is the probate fee calculated? It's based on the value of the deceased estate. So non-registered investments. So if you have a house and you still have a mortgage on it, that's okay because the value of that home less the mortgage is what they be based on. Jewelry, automobile, investments, and life insurance that is available to the estate. So if you say, I want my diamond ring to go to my granddaughter or my daughter, that will have to be appraised by an appraiser in order and that would become part of the probate. Assets that are included are the RSP, RIFs, life insurance, anybody, anything that has a named beneficiary other than the estate, jointly held assets. A lot of people say, well, I'll just add my child onto this joint asset. Between spouses, definitely jointly held assets that are absolutely a good idea. Exercise caution with jointly held assets adding their children onto it, even with a simple little bank account, property, especially with property, et cetera. So if there is a widower contemplating changing the ownership of the family cottage to joint tenancy with their son, first of all, the change would constitute a sale of the property, triggering a capital gain. And secondly, if the son was sued for any reason, the cottage would be subject to seizure. Finally, if the son was divorced, the cottage would be included in family property subject to division and may result in the need for a mortgage on that property. So in order to save that 1.5% probate fee, holding assets jointly outside of spouses is really, really not recommended. Also, I've got another piece here that um, bank accounts, the goal is just a bank account. Um, what the courts deem now is that there's a bank account or a DIC. This can be a practical and convenient way to deal with day-to-day -day expenses. 
it can substan substantially create problems after death, especially if the joint holder of the bank account is not the sole beneficiary of the estate, but simply assumes that they are now the sole rightful owner of that bank account. This assumption is often incorrect. The prevailing presumption in Canadian law that the bank account held in joint tenancy by the deceased is an adult child of the deceased does form part of the estate and should be turned over to the executor administered as part of the estate. Technically, this is known as a rebutable presumption of resulting trust. In other words, they can, it's just, they can rebut it. The effect that the joint bank account is held in trust by the survivor for the benefit of the estate, not joint tenant. Um, again, the joint bank account, same situation. What happens if a joint owner deceases you? What happens if that joint owner is in a lawsuit? What happens if that joint owner, all the situations that happen there? Also the long reaching arms of the government now, because they're saying, hold it, all these people are dying and we're not getting any money. They're saying, coming back and saying to the executive, prove to me, prove to me that, that was not part of the estate. Show to me where the joint person put money into that account. Show to me where that joint person claimed the income as interest on their tax return. If none of that is proven, the government can come back and say, sorry, we want our 1.5% on that money. So, you know, it's a long spiel on jointly held assets, but a lot of people are saying, oh, I'll just make it joint. If you have a bank account and you want somebody to look after it with you, have a limited power of attorney if you go to the bank to look after that bank account. You can also, if you are unable to look after your finances, then the lawyer can release that general power of attorney and let the people that you've elected look after the funds in that account on your behalf. And um, tax free savings plans are an excellent tool. It's tax free. You can have a designated beneficiary on there or a successor holder. Spouses can be successor holders. Children, charities can be beneficiaries. So successor holder, let's say both spouses have maximized their tax-free contribution room as of today. So they both have put in $75,500 into their tax-free. One of you passes away, that money can roll over to the spouse. You do not have to have the contribution room. Or as a beneficiary, a child goes directly to them. If they want to put it into their TFSA, they have to have the contribution room. So that's the, um, the probate. Probate fees as of January 1 have changed. This 50,000 is now free. And then it's 1.5% on the next 50,000. So a million dollar estate probate fee, 1.5% on 950,000 would be 14,000. $250. Some of money, you know what? I've seen it too often. Well, just make this joint, I'll do that joint. And it created all kinds of problems and more costs and legal fees than they would have paid in probate. Again, it's different in each province. Also, on that note with probate, um, you can have more than one will. So if you have a business corporation, that business would have a will for itself. And you would have a will for your own personal assets. If you have property in Arizona, Panama, there would be one will, recommend one will for that, and one will for your Ontario and Canada property. Um, the certificate of an appointment of a state trustee with a will. This is what the document basically looks like after probate has been approved. And that's that piece of paper that you're paying that money for. Family law considerations. People sometimes think, um, well, I'll go through the slide here first of all. Marriage will revoke an existing will unless that will was drawn up in contemplation of the marriage. 
Separation does not revoke an existing will. A person cannot cut a family member out of their will. That person is financially dependent on them at the time of their death. And the will must also provide a fair distribution for a spouse. So if a spouse's bequest is not equal to what would be provided under a matrimonial property law, that spouse may apply for a division of assets that would be similar to a breakdown of the marriage. And the above will not, may not apply if a marriage contract specifically deals with spousal distribution. So today, you see a lot of mixed families and stuff like that. And too often you see where the assets travel down. One person brings everything into the marriage and it ends up going down the opposite side family lines for family members that you didn't even really know. So you want to really make sure that you have marriage contracts in place or that will covers for that best as you can for that situation. Also, if there is no will, no marriage, this common law spouse, so if there's people that are living common law and they think, oh, well, you know, I've got a child together, Currently in Ontario, where there is no will, common law spouse, so i.e. not legally married, has no right to inherit anything from their deceased partner and has no right to an equalization under the Family Law Act. This applies even if two common law spouses had children together, even if the common law spouse is the estate trustee. Talk with your family. A family meeting. Discuss your estate plan with your family members, and this can reduce conflict during estate settlement. It can be especially important when assets may be, may be distributed unequally, whether actual or perceived between children. Specific assets, like I'm going to give you the family cottage, and you're going to get our house. And if there's a second marriage or blended family situation, can provide family members an opportunity to voice their opinions. If you're unsure about your plans regarding the distribution of your estate, a family meeting can help before any documents are drafted. So um, talk to them and you can't have a family meeting one on with all of them together and you do it one on one. Make sure you tell them your wishes and desires the same because one child will say, well, mom told me this or dad told me that. The other child says, no, that's not what they wanted. This is what they told me. So make sure that it's a united front, your wishes are expressed and that they understand what you're trying to achieve. The last thing you want is the will to cause a rift in your family. So what is an executor's role? Is to distribute your estate assets according to your will. The executor should have judgment and integrity. It can be a spouse, a personal friend, family lawyer, accountant, or a financial institution. Being an executor is a complex job. And your executor should be aware of what is involved to be willing and capable. Choosing an individual may mean more personal attention to your estate, lower administration fees. Choosing a financial institution usually brings greater expertise and consistency, but administration fees will be payable by the estate, typically 4 to 5% of the assets. Um, State canning can be a complex distribution or estate requires legal documentation. It can, um, can ensure your estate is distributed in line with your intentions, reduce taxes, and provide assistance to your named executors. In some cases, blended families and assets held outside of Canada can introduce additional complexities. And that's where I mentioned that sometimes, and again, that's where you would talk to your lawyer, um, you would want two wills. Without estate planning expertise, the distribution of assets may lead to potential issues or unintended consequences. 
And again, you know, deal with your lawyers and accountants that you know. But again, if you say, well, where do I go with this? We have partnerships with accountants and our lawyers who we refer people to provide you with the advice, the advice that you may need. Um, a couple of resources that we have is a will companion. So it's a one-stop document to uh, record your essential personal information, credit cards, et cetera. A resource to help your exam executors manage your assets, to provide a sense of control of your financial affairs. So just a quick clip that you can fill out, take a look at. And we have an estate planning questionnaire that um, is also available to just some things to think about. And um, something that's often overlooked as part of your estate plan is digital property. So what is digital property? It's an accumulation of your virtual assets that comprise a body of your virtual wealth. There's different components to it. Um, smartphones, iPads, to accounts, data, contractual rights, and intellectual property. So data is your emails that are stored on your email account. And accounts are conduits to accessing this data. Contractual rights are um, registration of a, let's say you have a website domain, um, advertising domain, affinity market. Um, digital intellectual property could comprise of things like music, artwork, um, YouTube videos, literature, things that you've on, on websites that may possibly be generating income for you or is out there. Um, this data needs to be protected after you've passed on. It must be secured some way so that your, your personal financial information isn't compromised. Revenue is still looked after. If there is any revenue coming in from that? And criminals target the deceased. It sounds so cruel. That is the reality, and that creates opportunities for theft and fraud. So that digital property, your executor needs to know where are your passwords, where are your passcodes. All that needs to be kept up to date so that, oh my gosh, I need to go in and secure that bank account. I need you know, statements are coming online. Um, how do I get into the computer? It's all part of it. And that's a big piece of the puzzle and fairly new now. How many people would think, oh, I should give somebody my passwords or know where they are so they can access my account? Um, did you have any questions? We're going to open it up for questions here. And um, you're welcome to contact our office to discuss any of these questions you may have. This is, our, this is our office staff. We have Dave Nixon, myself, and Chris Dawson. And our email addresses are on there. Our phone numbers are on there. And we also have a web page that was in the presentation, which was uh, thompsonnixonfinancial.ca, CA for Canada. Um, that's everything for me. Um, no way am I providing the disclosures. This is the next sheet basically is not providing legal advice providing accounting advice and that you should seek those professionals. I'm a planner. I'm the quarterback to help put plans into place. Um, I didn't pitch any products as there are products out there that you can have beneficiaries on um, side of a direct life insurance policy and effective ways. But again, this is just to get the nuts and bolts of what's involved with state planning. So at this time, I would like to Unmute your microphones and open it up. Any questions, any ideas coming forward? Well, thank you, Helen. That's very informative. We do have some questions in chat, so I'll address those ones. Um, the first one we have is how do you reverse how do reverse mortgages figure into an, an estate? Reverse mortgage is the um, financial institution that gave the money to the individual and their property. When that person passes away, that debt would get paid off. House, the home has to be sold. The debt would get paid off and any money remaining would go into the estate. If there's any money remaining. 
All right, uh, Mary, does that answer your question? Do you want more explanation yeah. on what a reverse mortgage is? No, that answers my question. That's for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then a question, can you explain why sometimes there are probate fees and sometimes they're not? Depending on the value of the estate. So i.e. if everything passes outside of the estate and all that there is is a bank account with two or three thousand dollars in it. Sorry. There's a bank account with two or three thousand dollars in it. Bank may not request um, probate fees. So it depends on the value of the estate. It also depends on the executor because probate determines who the executor is, ensures that, that it's a legal valid document and they can proceed. Usually, the biggest deciding factor would be the dollar value of the estate. Also something I forgot to mention now, your executor, 180 days, 180 or 90 days after you filed for, um, after the estate, oh, what's the process here? There's another legal form that has to be filed with the true valuation of the estate, um, 180 days after the person passes away. Anyways, there's a lot, some paperwork, it's fairly new and um, the lawyers are having a hard time with it the time period is so quick that this term needs to be filled and filled with the government for the estate. Probate, sometimes it depends on the value of the estate. That's the big deciding factor. Okay. Um, and then uh, you were talking about uh, the difference between a personal executor and then the fee that, uh, say, a company would charge. Can your executor take, if it was, a, say, a personal friend or a, a child, brother, brother or sister, can they, can they take a fee? They are also allowed to take a fee. They have to include it as income um, when they collect that fee. Yes, they can charge a fee. Sometimes <coughs> in the bill, it will, stay, it will state that they cannot charge a fee, except for expenses. And other times it will say that they can charge normal fees. And that's something that has to be in the will or it's just something they can... It, I don't think it has to be in the will, but I've seen it in people's wills. Okay. They can charge a fee. Sometimes, you know, I'll say, well, we're going to give them $10,000 and then I'll say, but no fee charged. So I either going to give them $10,000 for looking after, but and I'm not sure on that. Um, yes, the executor can charge unless it specifically says that they can't. And uh, I had a question. Um, you were talking about the, the diamond ring as being listed in the, uh, the will and that if it went to probate, then they would appraise that ring. What if uh, you know, I don't know, like I'll take my example, I'd say, oh, I want, you know, this person to have this necklace, and I want that person to have that ring. Like, is everything you specifically state in your will, they're going to appraise all of it? Absolutely. And because so, the government wants their, their pound of flesh, right. just one appraisal won't do. The same with real estate. If there's farm and then there's a cottage and then there's a house and you're the last one and it goes to the kids that all becomes part of probate you cannot take the municipal assessment um, and say this is what the value is you have to get appraisals by probably two at least two um, appraisers for the values for probate fees so, so now, I'm not giving legal advice here but what we often say is don't what, and a lawyer would guide you on this. Don't list the asset in the will. Put it on a codicil to the will. Yeah. I, I had an uncle and he had all his artwork. He had sticky notes on the back with the name of the person that was getting it. <laughs> so. Yeah, and that's fine. But what happens if, if they list a diamond ring, the person is no longer in their home and has been moved to a senior's home now 
oh dear me, where did that diamond ring go? How do you put a value on it? How does that person get that value now? Okay. All right, that's all the questions I have here. Does anyone else have a question that's, uh, I see yeah, Irene has her hand up. <laughs> okay, can you hear me all right? Absolutely, yeah. Irene. Okay, hi, Helen. Hi, nice to see you. Uh, yeah, nice to see you. Um, my question is if if you have, let's say, in a property listed, um, have listed one of your children as a co-owner, hmm? and um, how does that then work upon your death? Let's say both partners have, are deceased. This has already been established, and you, um, you know, you have one child as a co-owner on that property. Um, at the time when they became co-owner, um, there may or may not have been a capital gains triggered and that was all, or you bought it together. So that's fine. That's absolutely fine. It would just flow over to that, over to that child upon, upon death. Oh, so there's no probate or anything, it just flows no, over. It shouldn't. Okay. Okay. Anyone else have a question? On co-ownership, too, um, you can have what they call joint tenants in common and joint tenants with the right of survivorship. So what that means is um, the, let's say the cottage is listed with um, the son and daughter. And if it's um, um, passes on and it goes to son and daughter, right with the right of survivorship, if one of those children passes away, right with the right of survivorship, it'll flow over to the surviving owner. If it's joint tenants in common, the child that passed away, their share will be dispersed according to the wishes of their will so that that other person on that piece of property have to buy out and pay out the, they want to keep it, pay out the other owner. So tenants in common, it goes down the strips. The share goes to his family, her shares go to her family. Point with the right of survivorship, it automatically gets over to the other one. So there's different registrations. And that's mainly for property. All right. Any further questions from anybody? Yes. Okay, Nancy. Um, if you uh, can, is there any way of giving money to children or grandchildren as a gift before death? Does that decrease the taxes? You can give money away anytime you want, and there's no repercussions to anybody. Okay. The taxes, the probate fees are on the probatable assets. Um, and there's no, so when you give the money to the children, they get money and the estate has to pay the tax. They don't have to claim it as income. Right. Okay. So if you put your children as a beneficiary on a retirement savings plan, you get the money. Your estate has to pay pay the tax. Uh, but is it different for life insurance? Life insurance goes outside of the will. Mm -hmm. There's no taxes or probate. You um, make the estate the beneficiary of the life insurance, then yes, it becomes now a probatable asset. Okay. So any life insurance document the insurance investment, they're called segregated funds. They usually have beneficiaries on them, other guarantees, RSPs and RIFs, tax-free. They can all go directly to the beneficiaries outside of the will by passing probate. RSPs and RIF are taxable and there could be tax consequences on non-registered assets, i.e. your investment portfolio that is not RSP and RIF. Hmm. Okay. That's why that tax-free savings account is so good. It is a phenomenal tool. Yeah. Um, that's 
personally, what I try to do is um, take a look at my client's tax situation, roll down their RIF RSP. If they don't need the money to live on, flip it into the tax-free. Uh, Helen, uh, you actually, don't you have uh, limits of how much money you can put in the tax-free per year? $6,000 a year. Right now, your current contribution limit, if you've never put money into a tax-free, is $75,500. Mm -hmm. So there are limits annually. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that is set by the government each year. So I, if you've contributed 60000 to your tax-free out of your pocket, you have another 15500 that you can contribute this year. And do not go over contribution limit. The penalties are huge. So do you so check that? Is, sorry, sorry, Terry. So 75000 is the total that you can ever put into your tax-free savings account. Right. 75500 as of January 1st, 2021. Next year, it'll go up again. Okay. Unless the government changes the rules. Sorry, Terry. <laughs> That's all right. No problem. Green? Um, because of where things are right now with our government and the amount of money that they've given out, I feel that they will be looking for different places to access more funds into their coffers. Mm -hmm. And so I have read that, yes, they're looking at um, capital gains and changing capital gains. Um, our homes are on the line because they'll be looking at that. And um, so I'm just looking at what options do we have? I know that there are trusts too, that you can uh, put your funds into trust and use that method or the life insurance is the other method to pass your estate on without a lot of um, taxes. What are your views right now on that situation? It's forever a changing target. Right now, our economy is probably fragile because of the pandemic. Do they want to look at the capital gains? There's only 10% of the population that this really affects. So chances are it's not going to hurt them if they do increase the capital gains. So what we're talking about here is if you have a piece of property, an investment, and your net cost when you bought it was 100000 and it's now worth 200000 100,000 is deemed a capital gain. Government inclusion rate is 50%. So right now you've got a $100,000 gain. 50% is taxable. So $50,000 is taxable at your tax rate. If they increase that inclusion rate, you are going to have to include more of that capital gain for income that becomes taxable. Your personal home, your primary residence, when I say primary residence, is does not is not a capital gain. So i.e., we all know where real estate's gone. You bought your home for a hundred thousand and now it's worth half a million. You don't have to worry about the half a million for capital gains. If you're the last person um, in the state and you're still living in your home, then it becomes a probatable asset. Um, so that's on the home front. And again, let's say you've got a house and a cottage. And this is where your accountants come in. You can have one principal residence selection. So let's say capital gain on your cottage is bigger than your home. Accountants will work through the numbers. You can make your cottage your principal residence and your home the, um, the capital gains. But again, that's accountants will work through you with if that's your situation. So we do feel that the government, there's a chance that they may click into the capital gains part. As far as taxing your principal residence, don't see that on in the future. If you compare us to the states, in the states, the mortgage on your home is tax deductible. That's why everybody has their houses mortgaged in the state. Here in Canada, your mortgage on your principal residence is not tax deductible. So for them to start taxing the sale of your home, I don't think it's going to happen unless they can start 
from allowing you deductions for your mortgage payment. So I don't taxing your home per se going to be um, including that as income is going to happen. But the capital gains, I think it's on the horizon. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? It looks like we, we've hit the end of the questions for today. Um, Helena, thank you very much. That's uh, everybody uh, got at least uh, one, if not many more bits of information and knowledge that we didn't have prior to coming to today's session. So thank you very much. Um, so you're getting a thumbs up with some reactions uh, from the, the, the audience here. So we thank you very much. And anyone, if you want to get in touch with Helen, she uh, had provided some information and I think you can just Google her name and uh, you'll get her contact information online as well. Thank you so, so much. I enjoyed it. I hope I was informative enough on this. Um, there's our website. If you can see my screen, I'm not sure if we're still sharing. And, yeah. um, website. and the very last one had our contact information. I'll just put that up for now. Oops, there we go. Um, and again, you're welcome to reach out if you want any of those resources. We'll be happy to share them with you, send you an email. And um, yeah, Dave, myself, we're here to answer any of your questions. Absolutely. Thanks, Helen. Thanks. Thank Helen. you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for this opportunity and all the best. And uh, as somebody said to me, negative and stay positive. <laughs> <laughs>